to the April 16th MACMR meeting. I'm going to ask Commissioner McClendon to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. Well, you know, that's the way it's really supposed to be said. I mean, some people know how to say the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and some just do it the other way. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Director, you want to lead us in prayer this morning? Yeah, and uh, first off, uh, you know, I'd like to say that uh, I, I hope that everybody in uh, South Mississippi and all are praying for our friends in Israel and what's going on over there. So hopefully we'll be uh, be able to work out something, and uh, I'm glad that the good Lord let our military step in the other day and do the things that they needed to do to stop what was happening. So hopefully it'll work out. If we could, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. Lord, we just ask you to take each and one of us on this uh, the commission here and the people who work at the Department of Marine Resources or work with them. And we just ask you to give us wisdom, Lord, and give us the knowledge to do it your way and not ours. We ask you to give us the wisdom to do what's right and what's the best for the ecosystem and everything that we do as far as the system of the state of Mississippi. Lord, just take us and lead us and guide us and direct us. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. All right. <clears throat> Any discussion on the minutes from March 19th meeting? No discussion. Do we have a motion to approve? Um, Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Any discussion on today's agenda? Motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, Director. It's all yours. All right. Uh, well, we got uh, a few things going on. Obviously, the legislative session's in uh, hot and ready and going. Hopefully, it'll end up in the next couple of weeks. I know they're working hard trying to do that. But uh, before we get started on that, let's see uh, if I can find my agenda here. Let's get started with our employment. See if we have anything on the employment contracts. All right. You see the names of the new people that have been employed? Uh, or either that's all new employment let's see yep so uh, we've got uh, several new people that have come with us in uh, marine patrol and then we got some uh scientists that have moved uh, came in with uh, coastal resources and then off of both of those yep any questions on them we're always glad to have any of them and uh, we appreciate the ones that apply and uh, we hope that uh, one day we get to hire them all all right let's see as far as agency update all right, we got legislative session. What we have, we have House Bill 1006 is a recreational crab license uh, to individual, not households, and that's been sent, signed and sent to the governor. So hopefully we'll have it signed by the governor before long. Oh, I missed something on JW Marine. I'm sorry. Uh, we got a contract with JW Marine for 1.59. That's to put culture out. So uh, we're putting culture out on the property. That, that we, what this will be, we're still looking at trying to do the um, – on bottom leases and we won't be this culture be going into areas that we were going to keep anyway so it'll be in the state borders where we're going to keep it sorry about that y'all got to tell me i didn't see it all right moving along anything else on that i think we're done all right uh we also got house bill 1007 authorized printing of oyster tags this is where that uh, a, pr a oysterman can have their own tags and print them we give them the process to do it that's gone to the governor also uh, House Bill 1279, shrimp trawling, and uh, basically what this means is we would, uh, you could throw cast nets and uh, and stuff off of piers before uh, the way it was written, you couldn't, and we wanted to make sure that uh, that people are legal to be able to throw the kids to learn how to cast, and other people throw cast nets and different things, but you cannot trawl within that area, and so with a half a mile like we would always have, so that's gone to the governor also. Our House Bill 1783 appropriations, uh, they're working on it as we speak. Uh, I've talked with the uh, head of uh, Leanne this morning, and so they're working on it, and hopefully we'll get something soon on it. It looks like it's going to be very similar to what we had last year. Uh, Senate Bill 2648 authorized uh, 
uh, oyster lease uh, that is uh, in the conference. And then when I say that, that means that the House and the Senate are sitting down talking about it, and they will come together with a plan. I think they have one. They We've all worked on the um, the bill, and I think it'll be easy to go by, and uh, they just got to get it through conference. Other bills of interest is the House Bill 1439, Repairing Rights in Hancock County, and that's that area over there that uh, where other than uh, – than private property, just state property, where we're lowering it to, back from 750 yards to around 300 yards to be able for people to be able to put oysters. And so we're working on something with that, and uh, that's uh, gone to the governor. Uh, Senate Bill 2848, Variable Compensation Plan, uh, that is in a motion to reconsider. Uh, that is a way to be able to uh, get, that, get it to where personnel for the state of Mississippi can let us uh, decide when and when not we can give raises and how we'd be able to do it and not have to go to the legislature with it. So I think that's a good deal. And then Senate Bill 2780 is authorization of the Secretary of State to approve leases. That's in conference, and um, they've named the conferees from the Senate side, and it's Blunt, Thompson, and Younger. I'm not sure about who's on the House side, but I'm sure it's uh, going to be Brent Anderson and who else. But it's uh, basically about the uh, – leasing the property and having to have a lease. Uh, the, the main reason for that bill is that if you have a casino that you must have a lease with the state of Mississippi to do uh, Tideland's lease and be able to pay the state of Mississippi. That's the majority of what that's all about. They was, uh, they, I, I know uh, when they had to, it all came out when the uh, Supreme Court made a ruling on the area off of Veterans and uh, Biloxi, and that was where it came from, and that basically, uh, they're trying to make sure that they keep it the way it was supposed to be bent. All right, and then Senate Bill 2647 is a Comprehensive uh, Coastal Conservation and Restore Act, that had uh, Restoration Act, and it died in the Senate, in the I mean in the House. Uh, any questions on the legislature? All right, I uh, had Gulf Council last week. I'll tell you what, I... Uh, we was there from, uh, for a week in Gulf Council talking to them about what's going on and where we're at. We're still fighting our battle in, uh, uh, on the snapper. We're fighting very hard for it. Uh, several things did come up pretty, that, uh, that I was proud of, and we did have some good out of it. But uh, we're still trying to fight them to give us the uh, right. Uh, for the, you know, last year uh, we were only allowed 62,000 pounds. The... Uh, SSC, which is the stock assessment, they basically went in and looked at it, and uh, the scientists and said that, uh, well, we think it, uh, that Mississippi should get another 20,000 pounds for sure right now. And they passed it through them and said best available science, and then they also passed it through the, the uh, Gulf Council and said it was best that they wanted to go forward. Well, it did not get signed by the Secretary of Commerce. We gambled. We used, our, we used 18 of that 20. All right, so we gamble with it, and uh, and the reason for it is because it's there. There was nothing wrong with it. So I was talking to the uh, head of NIMPS, Andy Spellcheck, about it, and uh, we're explaining to him that the the Gulf of Mexico itself was about uh, seventy thousand pounds under. So we went over about seventeen thousand pounds. Alabama went over about four thousand, and our idea is there should not be any payback if you if the Gulf was not exceeded. If we didn't exceed the Gulf, then there shouldn't be a payback. And uh, matter of fact, Texas even stood up and said, we got 18,000-something pounds that we left on the table. We'll give them to Mississippi. You know, and uh, they, they, they were very gracious about it, and a lot of others are. So I think we'll get something worked out of it. And uh, we're doing the Mississippi Creole, the ML Creole, and, and you know, and, and I think that's going to bring a lot back to the table about what we're doing. So we're working with them. We're not throwing hatchets at them. We're working with them. We're trying to get it done, and we'll see where we're at. Any questions on that? That was the meat of the Gulf Council um, as far as us and other things that was happening. Uh, all right, uh, Capitol Day is tomorrow, so we'll be at the Capitol in, in the morning, and uh, we'll be set up there, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk, show some of the legislators what's going on and what we're doing there tomorrow. And uh, hopefully everything will work out. They're kind of busy right now. We got in between times of when we could do it. And so uh, with the session going along, we chose this time. Any questions there? Y'all welcome come up. Uh, Department of Interior visit is on May the 21st, and uh, they're going to come and, uh, and visit with us and uh, look at some of the things that we're doing uh, as far as our properties and everything else. And... Um, 
that shouldn't be a problem. I think we'll be fine with it. I was on a conference call with them the uh, other day, and they was pretty good. It was no problem with them. Next, uh, uh, the commission meeting. Oh, I, I think this is, is this the one right here? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's the May 21 when they're talking about it. But anyway, they're looking at Round Island, Wolf, Wolf River Coastal Preserves, and Jordan River Coastal Preserves. And uh, Jennifer, is there anything on that that we need to talk any more about? Or is that, it's it's just a standard day looking at what we're doing. I think we'll be able to show them a lot of things of how we've done some great things, and they're going to be happy with us, so that, I didn't think it was that. All right. Uh, next commission meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, May the 21st at 9 a.m. I'm going to be out of town, I guess. Or what, is, what is going on? Why is that on there? Anybody know why the next commission? Is that a holiday? Is there anything in there? Obviously, we don't know why it's there. All right. The uh, Bonnie Carey update. Uh, gosh, I had her sheet, and I don't have it anymore. Where's she at? Tracy, come on up real quick and give it for me, because you sent me the sheet, and I don't have it right here. Um, good morning. So we are working our way through the Commercial Vessel Safety Equipment Program. We received um, 145 applications 34 of those have been paid um and then we're very close to opening the processors uh, uh new technology grant um we are waiting on NOAA. we've reached out to them a number of times to be able to go back to 2019 um so just waiting on on their decision so we're getting there and we the second phase of the shrimp and the oysters the commercial fishermen the second phase of it is in action right now? Yes, sir. 60 of the 83-plus payments, um, those agreements have been signed, and they're working their way out um, to the fishermen. And the processors are in the process of working right now. We're going to get that out. Yes, okay. sir. All right. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. All right. All uh, right. Snapper update. Uh, snapper season, we're scheduled to open up uh, as a 24th. 24th of May, which is uh, Memorial Day weekend, as we've always done. Our goal is to open up from 24 May to the week after the, that, that following Sunday after the 4th of July. And we'll open up and be able to do our, our snapper season during that time as long as we don't overexceed our allocation. And uh, then uh, we'll reassess and see where we're at at that point. And right now we're planning on staying with the same two snapper per person and the same length, 16 inches, is that right? and everything else the same. Any other questions on that? Uh, one of the things we did, too, talk about at Gulf Council the other day was the possibility of opening up a uh, charter for hire as far as federal and all earlier. And I don't know that we'll get it through this year, but we're trying to get something to where that, uh, that we could change that and be able to um, uh, open up, you know, at least the same time we opened up our regular snapper season because that way, if people are, you know, uh, basically charter boating, uh, chartering for, you know, for people to come down, they could be able to use it, and that's a big weekend. And so, why not be able to try to do that? So that's something we're looking at. And uh, any questions on that? All right, FDA certification uh, we have for the DMR Dry Lab is in process. It's pretty much the certifications are there. Uh, they're doing the testing right now. They're growing uh, uh, area water. And, uh, and meat samples to be able to do some tests on it. So what this is going to amount to, if we ever have a situation like we had in 2019, we'll be able to do our own tests right here, and we'll do them right here in, in DMR, and we won't have to send them off and wait two weeks to find out where we're at. So with Christine and them, we're all doing a great job. Thank you all. We appreciate it. And uh, we uh, should have that all going wide open shortly, and so we'll have two labs now. And uh, so uh, up to date. Any questions on them? Uh, auction, we got an auction that we're going to be doing. We got a bunch of equipment and stuff and some vehicles that we're going to auction off. And I think we're going to, we're trying to go live on 1st of May and close by the 22nd. So it'll be accessible through the DMR website, www.dmr.ms.gov. So if you have any, um, anybody that's interested in it, uh, there'll be some information out there on it that should be on the website for you. 
Uh, derelict vessels, uh, we have 144 derelict vessel cases. 92 of them have been removed, 52 are pending, and we have six that we're re waiting on court orders for. So we are, and uh, we do have a federal grant. We have a federal grant to help us with that now. And uh, what was it, 1.5, I think, I can't, I can't, not here, but uh, I think it's 1.5 million, 1.6 million that we got to be able to do that. So what we are able to do now is we can go out and uh, we just have to do the environmental part of it and all to make sure, but especially during a time of a storm or something like that, when we have one, God forbid that we have one this year, I hope we don't, Lord, please help us. And uh, But uh, if we have one, uh, then we'll be able to get some of these derelict vessels out quicker. All right, any questions on that? If you have public comments, TJ's, where you at? TJ's in the back, back here. And happy birthday, TJ. Today's TJ's birthday, so, uh, but uh, he has, if you see him, if you need it, yeah, do you have something? Huh? Derelict vessels don't stack up quicker. Oh, I did it. I just did derelict vessel. Uh, <laughs> hey, Charmin, wake her up. Hey, I just did derelict vessels, I thought, didn't it? <laughs> All right, uh, uh, another one of those days. Okay, so uh, any other anything else that uh, that y'all have that we need to talk about? Anything that the commissioners have? Sir, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe. So nothing for the commissioners to report today. So we will move on along to Marine Patrol Chief. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good deal. I'm going to let uh, Captain Strickland do the report today. Okay. It should be short. Good morning, everyone. Glad you turned the light on for me this time. I always leave it off. Hope everyone's having a good day. Uh, you've had a chance to review the, uh, the commission report here that we've uh, uploaded, and I'm here to answer any questions that you may have on behalf of Marine Patrol. If there's no questions, I will bring your attention to the back. Uh, even though it's, uh, we're coming out of our, our winter months, that uh, for the year, our proactive approach to patrolling is uh, our citation numbers are still ahead of where we were last year. And also our boat stops are ahead of where they were this time last year. So we're, we're still out there on the water educating and, and meeting with the public. That's good. I've seen more presence over the past year or two, and, and it's good to see them out there. Yep. Any questions? All right, thank you. Keep up the good work, guys. They just about to get ready to get busy. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? All right, next up is going to be Miss Leslie Brewer, Finance and Administration. Good morning, everyone. I'm representing the financials um, for the month ending uh, March 31st. Um, at the end of the month, um, our state revenue was $5.2 million, our agency revenue was $28.6 million, and our state net, net income was negative $415,000, and our agency net income was negative $2.5 million. Um, we don't get our appropriations until after the year end, so we usually go into the negative about this time, so that's, that's normal. Um, after nine months of fiscal year 24, um, we have 87.2% of our budget remaining for operations, and our tide lens is at 54.1. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, real quick. Uh, yeah, at any time you see a negative under that, as she was trying to say, you know, uh, uh, the state doesn't give us the money. It'll probably be August. Se uh, September, usually. September, mm -hmm. you know, before they give us our money, but they, that's it. they still pay the bill. Yeah. You know, they, they just don't put it in our account. They just put it in there, and, it, and it, we just draw off of it, and they know where we're at. Right. And then a lot of the federal things are paybacks, and yes, so we have to wait till they come back, yeah, and, uh, and but they're, they're good with us. Or like the Mesa, it's we yeah, received yeah. in the prior year. A lot of money. those projects. So it's not like we're hurting. We we got we are okay with funds. Yeah, just for cash And uh, the other thing is that she was just talking to me this morning. Would y'all have a problem if uh, if we only gave the financial report once a quarter because it really doesn't change a whole lot and let's say something that we need to talk to you about? Would that be okay with everybody? And I'm kind of like seeing like we have a problem. Okay, well, Leslie, you have to come anyway. <laughs> and uh, 
you have to come in front of Jason and Louie can see you. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's my contract. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. All right, public affairs, Ms. Charmaine. Good morning. The Mississippi Department of Marine Resources had 10 media mentions since the March MACMR meeting. News items included the Celebrate the Gulf Marine Education Festival, the MDMR Commercial Vessel Safety Program application period closing, and the groundbreaking of the boardwalk in Pass Christian. The Office of Marine Patrol took part in the XL by 5 Health Fair at Hancock High School on March 23rd and CASA of Hancock County's Touch a Truck event on April 13th. Shrimp and Crab Bureau Director Jason Soche gave a presentation to the Hancock County Historical Society on March 21st. Benfish Bureau Biological Program Coordinator Megan Fleming presented at Van Cleve Lower Elementary School's Spring Day on March 28th. Megan, along with staff from the Seafood Technology Bureau and the Office of Coastal Resources Management, also participated in Nature Fest this past Saturday at the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science in Jackson. The final class of the 2023-24 Off-Bottom Oyster Aquaculture Training Program was held on Saturday, March 16th in the Bolton Building Auditorium with 13 training program participants in attendance. This class included presentations from several guest speakers and at the conclusion of the class, Shellfish Bureau staff conducted a gear exchange for program participants to return and pick up off-bottom aquaculture gear. The NIR, the Office of Marine Fisheries, Coastal Resources Management, National Heritage Area, Marine Patrol, and Public Affairs did a great job at this year's Celebrate the Gulf Marine Education Festival on April 6th. Hundreds of attendees took part in our agency's festival which was held at War Memorial Park in Pass Christian. Participants learned all about our Mississippi Gulf Coast through fun and educational activities from a variety of agencies and organizations who help us put on this wonderful event. Thank you, Charmaine. All right, we're going to do marine, fishery, marine fisheries next. Uh, just to clarify, the headline of this says certain fish species, but we're going to be talking about red snapper, I believe, right? Pretty much. Yeah, that was just the general title of the titling part that we're going to be addressing today. You confused me, man. That happens easy. Yeah, yeah. We'll make sure we're clarified next time. So, um, so we're we're doing regulatory changes to Title Twenty Two Part Three, red snapper bag and size limits, and this was essentially prompted to be able to have some added flexibility for the red snapper fishery currently. Um, this presentation is not does not have an NOI format at the end as far as emotion so if the commission has any questions and discussion and feels comfortable in moving forward with it we'll have to make that motion at the end so as y'all are well aware the current management regime for red snapper for Mississippi is a 16 inch minimum size limit a two fish per person bag limit um, and the primary goal of the regulate the regulation that's proposed is to allow the executive director the flexibility to be able to alter that management regime on an annual basis for this fishery. And we're given this authority under uh, Amendment 50, essentially that authority to set those bag and size limits delegated to each one of the states. And I think y'all are well aware that Louisiana has been um, using that flexibility for the last little while. So the language we proposed um, exists in Title 22, Part 3, Chapter 7. So that's where all the recreational bag possession and size limits are. Um, and it reads as the recreational fishing season bag limit and size limit for red snapper shall be set by the executive director annually. The recreational opening order for red snapper shall include language establishing the size limit, bag limit, and season structure for, for the corresponding season. In the event that the size and bag limit is not listed in the opening order, the established limits listed above in chapter seven will apply because currently they still exist in um, that chapter in the list of all the species. So essentially what we're saying here is that have the flexibility to be able to change. And if that determination is made, it'll exist in an opening order. And if it does not exist in that opening order, it will default to what the current size and bag limits are. And with that, I'll take any questions on the subject. Yes, sir. All right. One, one thing that, uh, is there a possibility or should we look at something in there? Because I'm just reading it, and uh, once again, things pop out at you when you're sitting here. Uh, one of the things that we lo we were looking at is in case a situation happened and uh, we had a lot of bad weather or something to that effect, and we, w and we wanted to move that and change the order, uh, can I change the order during the year or is it only one time annually? I think in that 
instance, what we would do was be able to basically put out another opening order okay, or have a closing order than a new season with the opening order, the way it's established. I mean, and a lot of this is correspondence with um, Marine Patrol as well, trying to develop a regulation that's going to allow them to be able to enforce whatever's in place. Um, right. and, and, and have I, a tangible document that lists exactly what it is. The reason I say that is like Louisiana was able to take theirs, and they was able this year, you know, because of the way that they have it written, that they could raise theirs to three, and then they could raise it toward the end of four if they needed to because they to catch their limit. And if we needed to do that, which I don't see it happening in the short term by any means, but if we needed to do that in Mississippi, that would give that authority to be able to do it that way. And we could change it in the middle of the season or, or toward the end of the season. I see what you're saying, Joe. If it said as necessary or as needed as opposed to annually, because annually implies a once a year thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Is there a way maybe we change the wording on that and uh, and uh, to where it's, uh, you know. I agree with you on that. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if I can type it in now or not. Uh, well, we can, we can make the motion with that. Okay, but I guess we need to have the exact wording. Yeah, you do. Yeah. We can also just take that word out completely. We just take annually out? Yeah. I'm looking for it. Okay. Does that work for y'all? That works for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just, that, that way it just leaves it wide open. Okay. Yeah, just take annually out. So we'll do that and, uh, all right. Can, can I... Can I just read the motion in for the record, omitting annually? Yes, you can. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Before I do that, do, do any of our commissioners have anything else on this particular issue? Jonathan? No, I'm good. I think Trevor was given some examples on what Louisiana has done with that flexibility here in the past. All right. So I would like to make a motion based on the staff's recommendation, the recreational fishing season bag limit and size limit for red snapper shall be set by the executive director. The recreational opening order for the red snapper shall include language establishing the size limit, bag limit, and season structure for the corresponding season. In the event that the size and bag limit is not listed in the opening order, the established limits listed above in Chapter 7 will apply. I will second. We got you, Mr. Hunt. Yep. Cam seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. All right. All right. Good deal. That was yeah, easy that, enough. That'll help us in case we ever get to that point. All right. Anybody got any other business today? And some public comments. We do have some public comments. I think this is the order that they came in. So we will start out with Mr. Ron Sheldon. He will, he's got a comment about Round Island and speckled trout limits. Mr. Sheldon and everybody else, please be aware there's going to be a timer on the screen there. And we've got an allotted amount of time to, to discuss this. Thank you. Good morning. We'll start all over again. I was here about a year ago and I was speaking to uh, uh, the council about the rapid erosion that I'm seeing on Round Island. I grew up in Pascoola for the last uh, 15 years since I've been retired. Uh, summer months, uh, I love my wade fishing out there. I'm out there a lot. I love the birds. I love the island. But Round Island is taking a major hit. I know uh, three, four years ago, time's getting away from me. We built that new island to the north and the northwest. But so far, that has done nothing to help Round Island. And what I have, these are old photographs that I had. This is about a 40-year-old photo photograph, best I can remember, uh, when the lighthouse was still sitting there. And I want you all to notice those trees, those pine trees to the right of the, uh, the island. Next photo, please. Uh, that's where Round Island Lighthouse used to sit. That's a current photograph. These are only a, a couple of months old. And remember where the lighthouse was at 40 years ago and those trees and look at the next photograph. That's what's left. And that has been accelerating rapidly over the last five years. Uh, I can tell you uh, 
uh, used to were the old Round Island lighthouse keepers. Uh, uh, I'll call it the trash pile because it showed up at the uh, shoreline there. It's now about 30 or 40 foot out there, and that's extreme low tide, but still it's there. It, it is disappearing rapidly on all corners of that <laughs> island. Next photograph, please. Uh, Jennifer, I think I spoke to you a couple years ago about this, uh, or maybe last year, about this palm tree. Two years ago, this palm tree, and these, these are terrible photographs, I'll admit it, I'm not a photographer, but this palm tree was probably 25 to 30 foot from the shoreline. That is, you can see the foundation, if you want to kind of get a reference of where it's at, the foundation, the rock pile where the lighthouse used to sit. Uh, next photograph, please. Uh, this is the north, northwest side of the island there. Uh, once again, you can look at all the erosion in the trees. Uh, uh, Hurricane Zeta took a huge toll. It scoured the, uh, the west side of that island, completely covered it. Uh, but the west side, especially on the northern tip, there is no beach anymore. It's just caving in, literally, if you go out there. There's a vertical drop off of about four or five foot where it's steadily uh, chewing in the island. Next photograph. Uh, like I said, I go out there a lot. That uh, tree off in the distance there you see laying in the water is the largest live oak that used to be on that island. Uh, it hasn't moved since it washed off in the uh, water right before Hurricane uh, Zeta. It's still staying in that same place. But once again, I'll show you that photograph but, uh, for the reference. Next photo, please. Ah, there it is. The same photograph. And I think that is the end of the photographs here. When I spoke to you a year ago, I think uh, the city of Pascagoula had some problems with turning over the property that they used to own or was granted to them. All of that's behind us now, from what I understand. Uh, and so the state of Mississippi, the residents of Mississippi, own this island fully. Uh, there were some problems. I understand when it was privately owned that we couldn't put dredge spools on the islands because they, the owners objected and we can't improve private property. I understand that. But my question is to the commission today, where are we at? Are there any plans to put dredge spoils immediately, something that will benefit that island, not restore an island that was there three or 400 years ago? So, Mr. Sheldon, um, before I turn that question over to the director, I'm gonna let you know, we're gonna give you a couple more minutes since you had two subjects here. We could have put these on two different pages. So if you need a little bit more time for your second part of it, we're I happy to do that. I appreciate it. Is that what, what the bell was I heard? I was over Yes, my time. the timer went off there a minute ago, but we're good. We're good. You're right. We're not going to run you out of the building. Okay. All right. <laughs> but anyway, that that's well, the question. I, I don't expect an answer today, but what I'm trying to do, and I'm going to go for the city of Pascagoula, Jackson County, Ocean Springs, uh, forget who else, but anyway, as they have dredging projects, you know, the city of Pascagoula and the county's getting ready to have a, a dredging project there and uh, the Inner Harbor and stuff, but we need everyone to cooperate. We, I uh, love that I, island. Go ahead, Mr. Tell you that DEQ has a project that we worked on and been working on for quite a while, and it's where they went in and basically uh, was trying to restore a lot of the island, in which they did restore a lot of the island. Uh, and but they're also working on uh, they is that's the one that the city of Pasagula owned a portion of it, is that right, uh, Jennifer? And uh, and they owned a portion of that area, and I think we just got it up to where we could purchase that or do whatever, whatever was needed through the DEQ. Is that correct? So the state was able to purchase the privately held portions of historic Round Island. The um, portions of the island that the city of Pascagoula held, they were not able to sell to the state because there were some restrictions on the property, but we've entered into um, an agreement with the city for management of the entire site. And if there are future restoration projects that the city is, is happy to work with the state to make sure that those are successful projects. But we have built back how much of that island? Jared, what's the acreage? 220 acres of is the new beneficial use site at Round Island. So we are working on it. Uh, we're, we're aware of it and we are working on it. And uh, I know that they're looking at all the portions of it. Obviously, you know, uh, getting it rebuilt as quick as possible is not easy. And uh, But uh, we're trying to do it. And uh, we do know that we, we see the need of that island. As another thing, we see the need of that island because of a couple of things of what it does. It protects us, a barrier type island that protects, and it also, 
it also helps us with uh, you know salinities and stuff that, uh, with the water, and it, it protects that by bring you know cutting back on the amount of salinity in the summertime and all. So we're looking at a lot of different things with it, and uh, and I can assure you that DEQ is working with us on a lot of different things, and uh, we will. Uh, if I can get a copy of those, we will. I will send that to DEQ and uh, talk with them and uh, and say, hey, if you don't mind that, I, and I'll get them to look at it and say, hey, these are some more areas we're looking at. Thank you, and I do appreciate it. But my purpose here is just to keep it in the forefront. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, no, we and, we uh, appreciate it. We have to get gotcha. tired of me every six months or a year, and and so will the other uh, uh, entities as well. But that's my purpose. Yeah, you know, we haven't forgot it about it. We know it needs to be done. And I know you had a second a part bit. to yours. If you'd uh, like to address a speckled trout or yes. something. Thank you. you know, I watched the timer this time. Yeah, we're gonna give you a couple minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, talking about speckled trout. And I had talked to Trevor uh, several times about this several months ago. Uh, the last couple of uh, weeks, speckled trout has picked up, but over the last several years, it has not. I speckled trout fish a lot in the wintertime, and I'm strictly recreational. Uh, never, uh, uh, I never reached my limit, even though I, I could do it. You know, I love catching the trout. But the numbers have dwindled in the summer. The numbers have dwindled during the winter. The last couple of weeks, it's picked back up since we had that little bit of rain and it pushed them out of the river. My friends and I all agree, everyone I talk to, that we are all in favor of reducing the quota, limiting the number of uh, 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 fish that you can keep over a given limit. I know the state of Florida has got the quota down to two. I'm not suggesting that. Alabama has dropped it to six with only two fish over the limit of 22 inches. I'm not sure Louisiana raised the size limit, but they also limited the number of fish. I cannot understand the reason, especially when speckled trout are spawning, why people need to go out to the islands with live bait and limit out day after day after day and then get four or five people in the boat. They are hammering the, the future of the, of the record, uh, speckled trout. Uh, here. I would love to see, uh, Commissioner, as you pointed out uh, earlier, I'd love to see it shut down during the spawn. I'm not for, I'm not against commercial fishermen. I support commercial fishermen, but it seems like the numbers are there and they're dropping down and everybody else has done something about it. The state of Mississippi seems to be having a sit back and, you know, let's see where this goes. I spoke to a friend of mine this morning that uh, also has a, a uh, some friends over in Alabama. Uh, they were telling him because of the severe restrictions that the Alabama has put on speckled trout, they have bought licenses in the state of Mississippi so they can come over here. So uh, anyway, my time, I'm going to give you a minute of it back. If you've got any questions, I'm through. You know where I stand. Yeah, just in, in reference to what he was saying, I, I told him we had discussed this in the past. And uh, in the past, we talked about a possibility a year, several years ago of do we need to look at at the spawning time of the year and do we need to look at some of the things of what we're doing that's something that has been brought up and uh not sure whether that uh i haven't heard it from the staff lately and i'm definitely not uh saying that that's what they're looking at but uh i know we've looked at uh <clears throat> I, you know a lot of i get it, the west side of the state wants me to lower it to 13 and 15. they want me to lower it to 13 inches and 15. Because they want to have the same thing that Louisiana has, so they don't have to question themselves when they're going across the border back and forth. So uh, we're working. Uh, I'm working with Marine Patrol on some way that we can work that out and not have to do that to the state of Mississippi, because I don't think that's the situation. But uh, I know, Trevor, any of y'all want to talk about this real quick because uh, they are they know more about this than I could even think about. Well, one thing I can tell you, I was actually having this exact same conversation with a gentleman on the phone on the way here this morning. And one of the things I, I, I spend a little bit of time on the water, so yeah. I've got a little firsthand knowledge. Uh, the first place I ever wade fished was Cat Island. And I grew up fishing that island. And I can tell you over the past three or four years, the fishing at that island has been better than I've ever seen it in my entire life. Um, we're consistently catching quality fish out there, plenty of numbers. Uh, things are looking good on the west side of the state. And that's that's my input on it. Okay. Trevor? 
Yeah, I, I appreciate the sentiments that are echoed here in public comment. I mean, it's always <laughs> nice to have folks come and, and provide what they're seeing and everything else like that outside of what we've talked to fishermen about and all that. So, I mean, really this kind of matches the conversations we've been having for the last little while when the subjects come up. Um, Bonnie Carey in 2019, record rainfall the two years pro or after that. Um, definitely seemed to have a hit on recruitment. Definitely kind of altered what we were seeing as far as our index of abundance goes. But um, as we normally have um, tried to do, we've tried to stay away from making rust decisions or, or move forward with anything that's overly impactful um, until we get a better idea of the but basically what the long-term recruitment trends are going to look like. Um, and I'll say, I mean, as far as the other states, you know, I think Mississippi kind of took the first step ahead of everybody else in changing to 15, which was a large change, um, considering two inches. I mean, a, a two inch increase is, is a fairly substantial regulation change in our world. Um, and I'll say what we have observed this spring does give me a little bit of hope because we've had our small trawl and sand crew go out and they're starting to pick up young of the year spotted sea trout. And we haven't seen those with those gears in the last three or four years and multiple stations, a lot of fish. So that links into what we talked about last year when the subject came up, where while the salinity might've been impactful for some species and really kind of caused some issues for folks finding different ones, it could have had a very, helpful boost in recruitment in areas that for the last four years have essentially been inundated with fresh water. And we're currently continuing the monitoring, all that kind of stuff. And really what we're getting to is trying to finish up the assessment by the end of this year and have another look. Um, from the technical perspective, when it comes to evaluating these things um, on the management side, the simplest way to put it is that when you have a shift in your index of abundance, which we observe because of the rainfall and the fresh water, and you have continually high removals, or at least removals that stay stagnant, like we talked about with MRIP and all the issues we've had as far as that goes, that leads to a um, more negative outlook to the stock than what you would imagine, right? Because your index of abundance is supposed to track relative abundance of the population. But if you're having to deal with the effects of fresh water and the fact that fish can move, then that gives you a different outlook, right? A decline in your relative abundance due to freshwater trends might simply just be that the fish have moved. Um, and then when you couple that with continuous harvest, that's kind of the situation we're in now. And so that's why we're trying to move forward the assessment this year, see what it looks like, continue monitoring that relative abundance and really see if we have a recruitment spike this year, because that'll give us a little bit more inclination as to the trend that we're moving in for the fishery as a whole. Trevor, let me ask you a question. <laughs> uh, with Louisiana's recent changes, which I'm overjoyed about uh, that, that they made those changes, do y'all think that's going to help us on the western end over there in Mississippi waters? I mean, I would have to think them keeping less fish right there on that border. Um, you know, I mean, those fish go back and forth right there, I'd have to think. Yeah, anytime you're talking about more biomass in the water capable of spawning, you're increasing the probability that you're going to get some additional recruits, especially on that western end. I mean, those fish aren't stagnant, right? I mean, for the most part, they are. They're kind of regional, but... To a degree, they still shift at, back and forth across some distance. Um, and even if they don't, the currents usually drag recruits and everything else around all over the place. So anytime there's more fish in the water, it's it's a better scenario. Um, and for them, they they had been battling that for years, um, trying to pass regulations and everything else to the point where they were at single-digit uh, SPR for a few years. And uh, we did... What was it, uh, last month or something, uh, maybe first part of this month, turn or loose about 4,000 six-inch speckled trout? Yeah, we've been continuously doing releases of spotted sea trout for the last few years. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, we used to turn them loose as fingerlings, 
and they'd t you know turn a hundred thousand or so of them. I think it became a uh, smorgasbord for a lot of fish at that time. So we decided that we would work with USM and grow them out a little bigger, and we're working that out with our hatchery up there. And so the idea was trying to get them to around six inches or something like that, which they have a better chance of living. And uh, so we're going to try to do that. Matter of fact, I was on a podcast last night, the Brown Water uh, podcast, and they was talking about it, and somebody asked it, hey, can we the next time can we turn them loose in Pasigula? You know, maybe we can. Maybe we can find a place to turn some, some loose over there too and help out. You got a question? Sir, I hope that answered your question, but you good. Trevor, the only question I have is that there's no real way of accountability to know if somebody's coming from Alabama to Mississippi, especially Round Island. Is there? I mean, is there any reporting? Recreational, I know there isn't, but commercial, is there any reporting on that at all or for hire? Is there any way to know who's coming over and utilizing our 15 fish? The regulatory structure of the commercial fishery doesn't allow for for them to be able to harvest spotted sea trout in that way. But I'll say on the recreational side, um, which we all know what we've talked about for years at this point um, on the Emirates side, you do have to provide, when you answer that survey, when we ask you Dockside, what's your state of residence, what's the county of residence, which allows us to be able to get a proportion of fish that are harvested out of state or from a given area. And realistically, what you're talking about with Mississippi, Unlike other states, I mean, we hover 10% or below when it comes to out-of-state harvest. Um, and I think where we see the trends of folks maybe starting to harvest more or folks coming over will be right there on the Grand Bay line. I mean, you got two or three ramps right there that are real close in driving distance and proximity that allow folks to be able to fish close. But once again, that's a, that's a common occurrence for that area. Appreciate it. And you said you think that the uh, there'll be a new stock assessment at the end of the year, some numbers that we can all look at? Yeah, we've been running um, summertime index for the last little while, which has allowed us to be able to put in essentially up-to-date data into assessments. So hopefully we'll be able to run that one and have it completed by the end of the year with this year's fishery independent information and um, likely some interpolated catch data just so we have it thank you trevor anything else all right that was an informative one mm -hmm. sometimes <laughs> <it's> <laughs> yes <clears throat> all right next up we've got mrs susan snyder uh reynolds property ocean springs <laughs> yes, ma'am. Right. Make sure the red button's on there. I'll push the red button. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, Director Spragans and Commissioners. My name is Susan Snyder. I reside at 318 Jackson Avenue in Ocean Springs with my husband, Chris. Our home was built in 1903 by my great great grandfather, and we have lived in the home for 40 years. Jackson Avenue is located in the historic district of Ocean Springs. I appear before you today with my concerns regarding the Reynolds property at the intersection of Front Beach Drive and Jackson Avenue. The Reynolds property lies a little over 200 feet from our home. The property was acquired after Hurricane Katrina by the DMR under the direction of executive director at the time Bill Walker with federal funds. The deed stipulates the following. The property herein issued conveyed shall be used for the conservation and preservation of its natural features in recognition of the public benefits in protecting it as a coastal area and associated ecosystems in the interest of present and future generations. The property shall be used and maintained forever as a natural area for the preservation, protection, restoration, and sustenance of its natural characteristics and features and of its ecological integrity and associated habitats for compatible use purposes. In 2023, the DMR amended an agreement with the City of Ocean Springs giving the city control over the property. 
without seeking public input from the citizens of Ocean Springs, especially from the residents living in Ward 2 where the property sits, the city has decided that the property will be converted from a green space to a gravel parking lot. Meanwhile, the city already has a parking lot less than 50 yards away from the reference property. A lack of parking in and around Front Beach is simply not a problem. We believe that the city's intent to convert the space to a gravel parking lot is a clear violation of the spirit of the deed, and more importantly, the legal terms of the deed. This decision will essentially destroy and forever alter the property in ways grossly inconsistent with the terms of the conveyance. In accordance with the deed, I quote again, the grantor or any citizen of the state of Mississippi may enforce these covenants and conditions using all remedies available at law or equity, including injunctive relief. With all due respect, we request that the DMR amend its agreement with the city of Ocean Springs and require the city to follow the guidelines in the conveyance so that the property will retain its natural character and remain green in perpetuity. We are prepared to exercise our rights under the terms of the deed and to seek legal remedies should it become necessary. Thank you for allowing me to address you this morning. You wanna? I, I can just tell you, I, I talked to you earlier and uh, you know, we're looking at everything, uh, we're following uh, we had let the city of Ocean Springs use that as a o overflow parking for several years, and they've done that. And uh, when this was brought to our attention about being able to put a parking area there because they was going to build a harbor or, or port, uh, I guess it was a marina. And um, so we uh, looked at it, and we did uh, ask Fish and Wildlife, and Fish and Wildlife did give us permission to say, yes, this would be in something that we could use that for, and it could be done under this. And uh, so... Uh, we're still looking at it, and uh, we understand your concerns, and we're still looking at it very hard. And uh, and I can tell you that uh, we're con we're talking back with legal, and we will uh, as soon as we get. As I've told several of the uh, of the uh, people in uh, Ocean Springs area before, DMR makes a hundred percent decision on what they're going to allow or not allow. We will sit down with you. Thank you. All right. Our last public comment today is going to be Patricia Creel, the MR property in Ocean Springs. Same property. Same property. Hi, my name is Patricia Joachim Creel. I live at 517 Rayburn Avenue, but I own the property directly next to the DMR Reynolds property. I was not notified when the amendment was done to change this to allow parking. Now, I know that the commissioner has received videos of activities that have happened on this property, usually on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, by underage teenagers. Okay, I'm sure they're underage because if you were legal age, you probably wouldn't be doing these acts out in public because you would be able to go downtown and drink at a bar. But they're doing things that are not good. They probably don't want anyone to see, but there are cameras on people's homes that you can see these items. If you would like to get a copy of the videos, I will surely send them to you. But it's inappropriate. It's not welcomed. They are doing donuts. There are little animals and birds who have been nesting on this property, um, and they can't anymore because of what's happening on this property. The amount of trash, it's my husband that picks it up usually and my daughter um, when he's cutting the grass because we make sure our grass is always green, always cut, always maintained there even though we haven't started building our home because we want to maintain the beauty of next to a conservation property having green, okay? Putting gravel down is never going to be green. If they're doing donuts on the dirt and throwing it all up and it's muddy, it's not going to be any better with gravel. I abhor 
please do not allow this to go through. Thank you for letting me address you. And uh, yes, ma'am, and I have uh, advised the mayor because I did see the uh, videos that you sent me, and I have advised him on that, and I told him that, uh, that it was sent to me. So he does have that, and uh, he was uh, addressing that with his uh, people in the city on it. All righty. If we don't have any other public comments, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion to adjourn. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone, for coming out today. Meeting adjourned.